this when I'm sitting on a hard block of wood. It's testing. Hello. <clears throat> All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. I'm grateful that you're here, spending a little bit of your your Monday with us. It is Monday, right? Is it Monday? I don't know. Feels like Monday. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, there's plenty more food in the back if you guys want seconds or whatever. Um, we invited some people from this community of Kiln to come in and and pound some food too. But for the record, if there's leftovers, I expect you to take it because they won't let me take that on the airplane back to Colorado. So please feel free to clean house on your way out. Uh, and those cookies were baked like fresh just for us because they didn't have enough cookies for our order. So they literally came out of the oven like an hour ago. It's like as good of cookies as you're ever going to get. So, <clears throat> But welcome uh, and welcome to everybody that's here and also welcome to everybody that's virtual. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got about 300 some odd people that have also RSVP'd virtually to take place in this. And we're very grateful to have Tom Burton with us. So Tom, thanks for being here. Good to be here. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah. So, you know, part of our purpose in putting this on is to be able to tell more stories and learn from the founders that have gone before us and built amazing things. And Tom has obviously built something incredible with Health Catalyst, and it's been a very long and amazing journey, and you've built something truly incredible. So I think, you know, let's just go ahead and, and jump in. Um, it might be good to just start with maybe your quick description of yourself. Sure. And then we can go from there. And it, maybe I'll take care of one high, house cleaning item before we get into yeah. it. But. Um, so Tom Burton, uh, one of the two co-founders of Health Catalyst. Uh, background is computer science. My dad bought me a Commodore 64 when I was about 14 years old. So that kind of dates me. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, loved computers and programming uh, most of my life. Um, went to BYU, uh, got an MBA uh, and a bachelor's in computer science, um, and then had various uh, jobs uh, leading up to uh, Health Catalyst, which started in 2008. So um, just uh, go ahead and do the housekeeping. Yeah, yeah, I was going to go to this next thing. So for, for everyone that is virtual, uh, if you would, if you have questions during this, you'll go to this URL or attempt to uh, scan this, uh, this code on your screen. Then you can submit questions, and I will have it on my phone. And for the Q&A part, I'll do my best to go through that for everyone that's virtual to be able to throw in questions that, uh, that you guys are submitting as well. Because we're streaming on YouTube, and YouTube doesn't allow us to actually submit questions the way that you would on a Zoom webinar. So uh, for those that are virtual, please hop into this real quick. And, uh, and you, can, you can do it here as well. Yeah. You can also sure. upvote uh, questions. So if there's a question you like, just upvote it, and we'll, we'll pick the highest, highly Excellent. voted questions. I like that. Yeah, so go for that, too. Um, but otherwise, yeah, let's jump right in. So Tom has prepared some remarks for us and giving a little bit of the journey, but why don't I let you start it off, and yeah. then I'll pepper you with questions throughout this thing. So I thought I'd uh, give a little of my background. Uh, you know, we all benefit from mentors and, and from examples and those that have gone before. And these are four uh, great mentors of, of mine. Um, as I said, I, I went to BYU, finished my MBA. Uh, first job uh, out of college was down at Checker Auto Parts, uh, corporate headquarters in Phoenix. So I did that for a few years. As a 20-something year old, I, I helped them go public, wrote an analytics program that dramatically reduced their inventory and increased their sales, and got to even write part of the S1 as a 20 I probably was like 25 or 26. So that was exciting. Um, but once we went public, things kind of changed. And yeah. everything was all about the quarterly earnings. And, and the innovativeness that I really enjoyed kind of went away. Um, so I left uh, Checker Auto Parts, and I joined my, my father-in-law's business uh, in real estate and did real estate development for a while with the Carden companies. Um, did that for about four years, did a lot of automation, built analytic systems there, ran out of things to automate, so I started having to read legal contracts, like real estate deals. I actually built a, a power center with a 25-plex theater and a Costco and a bunch of stuff in the middle. About 5% of that was fun, like actually laying out the plan. 
and 95% of it was, you know, negotiating a misplaced comma in a legal contract. So I, I'm like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. Uh, I got to be building stuff. I got to be, you know, designing stuff. And so um, in about 2002, I left and uh, came up and joined Intermountain Healthcare. My dad um, actually started with Intermountain years ago. He was the very first physician hired on the management team at Intermountain. He was an emergency room doc. And when I was about 15, he had a really severe back injury, had to have back surgery, could no longer practice medicine. And so um, the senior leadership invited him to be, you know, the first doctor to be on their kind of top five management team. And so he started there and, and he actually started, he was the first CEO of what's now Select Health. Mm -hmm. And way back then, he had kind of seen the vision of we've got to bring the payer side and the care delivery side together under one umbrella. And so, so he did that. He recruited another mentor of mine, Dr. Brent James. Um, and, and Dr. Burton and Dr. James were kind of pioneers at Intermountain, um, applying uh, quality improvement theory to healthcare. Um, and some of you may have heard of Deming. I don't know. Raise your hand if you've heard of Deming. So Deming's the reason we're all speaking English and not German today. Um, he really was the pioneer in figuring out how to improve manufacturing quality. And we basically, in World War II, outproduced the German army. Uh, just better tanks, better airplanes, better mm -hmm. everything at a lower cost. And after the war, he's, he's like, yeah, we could apply this to making cars or making, you know, whatever. And uh, he took those ideas to the big three in Detroit, and they said, nah, it's, it's all about style. And so he went over and he taught these principles to um, Toyota and Honda. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, and that's very much the way the 50s were for cars. Yeah, it, it was really style. Was it was the fins. Style. It was the... Everything, yeah. yeah. That's what it was. Anyway, Dr. James studied with Deming. And so uh, my dad and, and Dr. James wanted to bring those same principles, which is how do, you, how do you systematize a process? And instead of cars, it's people, it's, it's patients. And how do we care for them in a consistent way and improve the quality of the care and reduce the cost of the care, which is what Toyota and Honda did. So, they were on this journey, and they started doing those things, and they realized we've got to have a measurement system. We've got to be able to analyze how we're doing. And so that's when they brought Steve, who is the other co-founder of Health Catalyst, into the equation. And Steve built the first data warehouse in healthcare back in the mid-'90s um, and refined that over time under the direction of Carvel Whiting, who was the chief information officer at Intermountain. So I joined uh, Intermountain about 2002. And they'd already had this world-renowned, high-quality. People were coming to a class that Dr. James taught on quality improvement from all over the country, all over the world, really. And I started in financial systems. I wanted to start in clinical, but Carvel, the CIO, said, we need you in financial systems. They had a bunch of homegrown stuff, and it kind of needed to be kind of upgraded. And so I built the first e-commerce engine inside of Intermountain and helped save a couple million dollars there. Um, and so then I shifted over to the clinical side is just about the time Carvel was retiring. And I decided, you know, if I'm going to be on the clinical side, I want to go through Brent's class. And I want to understand what he's, what he's teaching all these people and understand these principles. And it was one of those kind of life-changing events where you go, that's what I want to do the rest of my life is, is work on that stuff. And so uh, I went through his course. I learned quality improvement theory. I learned uh, about Deming. I learned all these principles about um, process improvement, about measurement, about how do you get people to change behaviors. And uh, what was interesting, and this is kind of where the spark, the idea of Health Catalyst started. You know, we'd, I'd be chatting with my fellow students, and they'd be like, oh, man, this is so cool to learn all this stuff, but it's going to be too, it's going to be impossible when we go back home. 
You know, we don't have a Dr. James or a Dr. Burton. We don't have this cool data warehouse that you guys have here, and it's just going to be way too hard. And so Dr. James and I started talking and, and said, well, what if we did more than just teach a class on this? What if we actually helped them? And so uh, that's where the idea kind of started. We uh, had, a, at the time, we had built our own electronic medical record. And uh, we got, Carvel retired, we got a new CIO, and he's like, why the heck are we building our own medical, you know, these things are expensive, you know, there's a, a bunch of alternatives out there, why don't we just use that? And at the time, Carvel put me in charge of the, the homegrown EMR team. We had a bake-off. And we had the top five EMR vendors in the country against, uh, you know, our homegrown thing at Intermountain called Help, Help Two. And we let the doctors decide, and they all decided we like Help and Help Two. It's way better. Mm -hmm. And so, speaking of Bake Off, don't forget the cookies. Cookie, yeah, another plug okay. for the cookies. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, we looked at that and. And the doc said, no, we want this. It's way better than anything that's out there in the market. So our, our new CIO decided, well, let's commercialize this. If it's so good, we should sell it. So we started a partnership with GE, and that was going okay. And then GE went and bought one of the five, and, and they kind of said, well, just make it work on that. Hmm. And that kind of, there was a lot of clash there, and, and uh, it didn't quite mesh as, as we had planned. A little corporate coming in there. Little, little, yeah, a little uh, less, uh, less effective innovation. Um, you know, we were very agile, and, and uh, you know, GE had a very deliberate waterfall kind of a process, and those cultures kind of clash. Um, eventually, that, that partnership dissolved. Um, in the meantime, Steve and I um, had started talking with with Dr. Burton and Dr. James about, let's go help others. We had already had a data warehouse up and running and been running for 15 years, and it was helping us save lives and save millions of dollars. So we said, well, why don't we kind of, you know, disconnect from this GE thing and just go teach people how to do what we've been doing, and we could share with them the software we've developed. And so we started developing this whole business plan um, which was really the business plan for Health Catalyst. And we pitched it to the, to the brand new CEO, um, Charles Sorensen, and said, we think we should do more than just uh, you know, teach a class on this. We should, mm -hmm. we should go do consulting on this. We should start a new division of Intermountain. And Charles, brand new CEO, I don't blame him. He's like, man, this sounds risky. You know, we're not a software company. We're not a consulting company. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of turned the, turned the idea down. And my dad was upset. He was like, this is going to be, remember when I said you should start Select Health? This is going to be bigger than that. You guys should do this. And That's after. A coming from your father, too. Yeah, after, after uh, he said that, you know, and, and Intermountain had kind of passed on the idea, my dad said, well, I'm going to retire. So he retired. But Steve and I had kind of gotten excited about this. And so. Um, the health system up in Minneapolis called my dad and said, hey, can you come speak at our, our big physician conference coming up? And he said, no, I don't like to travel. So he sent Steve up there instead. <laughs> so Steve went up there, pitched, here's what we're doing at Intermountain. Here's how it's working. Here's why it works. They're like, hey, can you guys come help us? And we're like, well, we kind of have jobs at Intermountain. And so but for the record, this is a great way to start a company, right? <laughs> have a job. Get a client out somewhere else. Pay for the thing you're going to build. This is awesome. Keep going. <laughs> so anyway, um, Steve tried to help them hire a chief analytics officer. Mm. And they went through like two or three candidates, and no one wanted to move to the crazy coldness of Minneapolis in the winters, um, which they're very cold. Um, and so after the third time, and, and Steve and I, at that time, the GE thing was kind of falling apart. And Steve and I were like, well, what, what if we just went and did this? What if we took the business plan that we were planning to do as a new department in Intermountain? What if we did that? And so um, 2008, uh, we went up and pitched the idea to Alina. Um, they said, yeah, this sounds great. We got some really good legal counsel. 
Don't just be a consulting company, be a combination of consulting and software. And that was really good advice. And so we said, we'll do this, but we'll only do it if we can own the software coming out of this and you still pay us a consulting fee. And the legal team at Alina didn't like that. They were like, wait a second. And uh, we walked away from the deal actually and said, that's oh, fine, okay. good luck, you can do it. You can try to do it on your own. And the chief medical officer said, you know, basically strong armed the legal team and said, we need this, our patients need this. These two guys are taking the risk of leaving their comfortable jobs, creating this startup, we're gonna do it. And so she kind of muscled it through and said, you can own the IP and we'll pay you a fee, you know, and it was a year and a half exclusive deal with them. Mm -hmm. And you got an internal champion? And we got this first so many champion customer. <laughs> And so, yeah, it, it turned out really great. It wasn't that scary to leave Intermountain because we had this signed contract with our first customer for a year and a half, so we had a nice runway. And, and Steve and I are super kind of conservative, so we like paid ourselves half of what we were getting paid at Intermountain, just lived really scrappy and, <laughs> and you know, put a bunch of money away so that we could, uh, you know, have some money to hire people when that, when that time came. Mm -hmm. For the first three years, it was just kind of me and Steve. And, uh, and it, the, probably the scariest part was when we finished our deal with Alina and then had to sell to the next customer. And we had no idea how hard selling is. Like, first of all, the sales cycles are like 18 months is speedy. And so, you know, we're two, three months after our deal with Alina going, Man, this is hard, <laughs> and that was scary. But luckily, we were—you know—we had a nice little nest egg that we saved from that first deal, and we had a couple of customers. Word of mouth, Alina had really strongly endorsed us. Uh, this is the greatest thing, you know, we've ever had, and it's really working, and we're improving care for patients, and we're saving money, and so really strong en endorsement from that first customer went a long way, and and so that, yeah, that's kind of how the. Health Cattle started. That's awesome. So I think that gets you to the starting point. I feel like there's, there was one more juncture there that kind of lifted you out of being a regular startup and really put you on a different trajectory. Yeah. Um, would you mind sharing that component? And then I know you've got a lot of other really valuable stuff you yeah. to share with us. So um, that, that happened. So we had, we'd started to grow. We had our second, our third, our fourth customer. Um, you know, we'd hired our first employee. Uh, that was scary. Now it's not just your own family, but somebody else's family you're worrying about. And uh, those of you in startups know that's, that's scary, making sure you have enough money to make payroll and that kind of thing. But we had, we had started to grow. We had about five team members and about seven customers. And uh, one of those customers was Stanford. And we're this little you know, teeny company in Salt Lake City. Still didn't even have an office. We were working out of my study and, and mm -hmm. Steve's basement. And Oracle had just built a $20 million wing of the Stanford Medical Center. And it was us versus Oracle. And uh, because we knew what we were doing and we had that track record of doing it Alina and several of other clients, they were like, no, we're gonna go with these little guys that actually know what they're doing. And, and they chose us over Oracle, which was like a miracle. And so we had started working with Stanford. And uh, so the Stanford chief medical officer had a relationship with one of the partners at Sequoia. And he's kind of this, you know, kind of, it's all crap, all of the software out there for healthcare is crap, but there's nothing good. And so Mike Dixon, one of the partners there, was at lunch with the chief medical officer at Stanford and said, hey, what, you know, what, you're always seeing new stuff. What have you seen lately? Anything that we should be interested in? He's like, actually, there's this little teeny company out of Salt Lake that knows what they're doing, and we're going to go with them over Oracle. And Mike's like, whoa, I better check these guys out. So he Googles. You know, Googles us and find he's like, this can't be right. This is a house. It was my house that he's looking up on, <laughs> on the internet. 
So he calls our, our number we had listed, which was Steve's cell phone number, and leaves a message. By that time, I'd asked my brother to help us. We were so busy on the clinical, you know, data warehouse side that I'd asked my brother's brother had a little private equity fund, and I asked him to help us, you know, kind of do the back end accounting, do the back end negotiation of our contracts. Because I had to go back, and I was actually, you know, programming again, which I love. Uh, so I wasn't. It was like twist my arm accounting versus writing SQL. I write SQL any day of the week. Right. So anyway, um, Mike Dixon leaves his phone phone message on Steve's phone, and he was on a trip or something. He comes back, and he's like, got a couple of messages from this guy, Mike Dixon at Sequoia. Should I call him back? You know, Steve and I didn't even know who Sequoia was. So uh, my brother Dan, who's like, uh, you know, he's brilliant. He's a Harvard MBA. He's like, uh, yeah, yeah, Steve, we should call him back. <laughs> and so we called him back, and they're like, you know, Tom and Steve, we've talked to all of your customers. They're all ecstatic. They're all happy. They all love what you've done for them. Every health system in the country needs this. And you're not growing fast enough. You're growing kind of bootstrapping. You're, you're mm -hmm. you know, growing incrementally as you can afford it. You've got to grow way faster. This is a land grab. And you've got something that works. And you're three or four years ahead of everybody else. And so... And just for the record, for those that are watching, Sequoia is arguably one of the biggest and best venture capital funds on the planet, one of the originals. So this is yeah, pretty my, unique. My brother Dan it, it's said, like Steve uh, Jobs calling you." Yeah, my brother Dan said, uh, "Yeah, you may have heard of some of the companies they they backed: uh, Google, Yahoo, you know, Apple, just a few. You yeah, know, yeah, we're yeah, like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, we should probably call them back." <laughs> So we did, and a couple months later, and this was would have been uh, September, October of 2011, they infused about $14 million of, of capital into the company and said, pedal to the metal, you got to grow this fast. And so we started hiring ahead of our sales, getting people ready to go, and the sales came, and, and we grew a ton. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was interesting. Um, you know... And I'll talk about this in a little bit, but Carvel at that time said, guys, you know, take some time and write down the things that can't change. I'm going to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about you know, that whole process. That was probably some of the best advice that we got was from Carvel. That's so awesome. let me give you a little more background now of who Health Catalyst has become, yeah. kind of what we do. do. So our mission is to uh, be the catalyst for massive, measurable, Data informed improvement in healthcare, and we we worked with Jim Collins on a flywheel, and this is the flywheel we came up with. So it starts by us beginning a relationship with a customer. We install our data platform. Most health most health systems have fifty or sixty different technologies that don't talk to each other. You know, so the billing system doesn't talk to the clinical system that doesn't talk to the lab system that Doug is on talk to the pharmacy system. So you got all these 50 or 60 different technical software products that don't talk to each other. And so the first thing that, that our software does is it brings all that data, puts it in one location and connects it. So you can see a patient's information across all 50 of those systems. Next, we build analytical applications on top of those that deliver insights of how you could be better, what you could do differently. Then our services kick in and we help actually make the changes. That's the hard part. It's one thing to know you could be better. It's another thing to actually make the change. So we have clinical and operational teams that go and work alongside physicians and nurses and operators to make the changes happen. Well, that happens. Lives are saved. Lives are impacted. Millions of dollars are saved. And our customers are happy. And so then they um, renew their contracts with us. They tell their friends about it. And it just is this positive flywheel. Now at the center is our team. Um, engaged, committed team members are the real secret sauce of why we've been successful. So now we have over 1,000 team members. Um, 
We've done over 250 improvement case studies that we've published, you know, probably over a thousand that we've done, but we've actually published over 250 of them. We went public in 2019. Um, we're now helping over 100 million patients across the country, across the world, really, um, over 500 hospitals, 5,000 clinics. Um, we've won about 50 best place to work awards. So lots of positive stuff has happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this is the core. This is the mission that drives it all, the purpose behind it. And here's just kind of a map of, you may recognize some of the health systems we work with. And what's interesting is it works across the board. Large integrated delivery networks, you know, small little. I was uh, down in Louisiana last week with Thibodeau Regional Medical Center, a little small regional hospital that serves just the southmost part of Louisiana. Um, from children's hospitals to academic medical centers, what we found is these principles that we're, we're teaching our customers really ap apply across the board. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit more of, of the story. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, and building all of it in a decade is also impressive. Um, there's so many elements that I, I wish we were diving deeper on from a startup perspective, but there's this, I think, this evidence of what you built that's so powerful and I think key to what became your success, like you said, are the people which ultimately is reflective of the culture that you've been able to cultivate um, within your four walls, right? And really well without it, <laughs> you know, outside of, of what you've been able to build. So I'd love to keep going down yeah. this and, and dive into what's made this so amazing. So I'm going to call this our tasting menu because, like, I could talk for hours on this, and I don't want, you know, it's right after lunch. You guys just <laughs> ate. I don't want to put you to sleep. We put you on hard chairs for a reason. <laughs> But uh, so I'm just going to hit kind of the tops of the ways of a couple things we learned about culture. And then, um, you know, we didn't invent any of this stuff. There, there's a lot of great books that we learned from. But then we took those kind of timeless principles in the books. And I'll share some of those, my favorite books that, that we kind of learned from. But we found a way to pragmatically apply the principle. Like, how do you make that a reality? A lot, I think a lot of us have, you know, read a book and we go, wow, that's a really great business book and had all these great principles. But then, you know, you kind of go back to your day job and, and you, don't, you don't really see it change in real life. Mm -hmm. And so part of our real focus as we built the company was how do we apply the principles and make them an everyday reality? And, and uh, I think that was another kind of key. If those, are, if those are probably top two well, first, we were just blessed. That's probably the top, top key to our success is we felt like we were blessed because of the mission and, and trying to do good in the world. But um, really focusing on the culture and then applying principles, timeless principles in pragmatic ways, I, I would say are some of our key factors of being successful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the tops of the waves of some of those principles okay. and uh, be submitting questions on the app, and then we'll pause after cultural, and we'll, Jesse, have you kind of pick a few, and then we'll we'll pause at the end for okay. some more. Sounds good. How Let's much do time it. do we have? We'll do, do a little chime. We have about thirty minutes, twenty minutes. Yeah, we want to leave some time for Q and A. Probably fifteen, 15, 15 minutes. Okay. 15 minutes. We'll be the very very tip top. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So uh, importance of culture. So uh, I want to. We'll do a little slide. Uh, a little uh, interactive. So Gallup um, has a survey they, they do to employers and employees all over the world. And they've created this uh, ratio of engaged team members or employees to disengaged employees. So the question is, what do you think the average ratio is across the United States? So five engaged to one disengaged. Three to one, two to one, or one to one. All right, so let's see, let's see if I can launch this poll here. I think I can do it too. Well, can you can you launch it? I think so. Let's, let's play see. on this thing. All right. Yeah, there we go. Should be wrong. Here we go. So on the phone. Let's see, it will give you a few few minutes here to or a few seconds here to Get your answers in. So one to one, two to one, five to one, or three to one. I'm 
Man, we got a bunch of pessimists on the line. This is great. <laughs> one to one. <laughs> okay, we'll leave that going for a minute, and I'm going to kind of share some things, and then we'll we'll answer that in a few minutes here. So, as I mentioned earlier, Carvel talked about um, now you're growing. He said, take some time and write down the things that can't change. You're going to have to change a lot of stuff now that you've got the Sequoia investment, but what are the things that you're not going to change that's kind of the heart of the company? And so Steve and I did that. We wrote down these five things, and those over time, we developed them further, and, and they became kind of what we call the health catalyst way. And we did something pretty unique. When we went public, we actually put in the box on the very front of our S1, we put the health catalyst way, and we said, we're different. Mm -hmm. We're about culture, we're about improvement, we're about helping save lives and improve uh, the lives of our customers. So this is what it turned into. Now, the way we came up with this, we, we looked at some companies that do this really well. Um, and this is us at Disneyland, where we actually spent some time with the Disney Institute. We went and did a behind-the-scenes tour and figured out how does Disney, which is, you know, they do not pay their people a ton more than they pay people at Lagoon or Knott's Berry Farm or any of these other places. But the experience there is night and day, if you've ever experienced that. It's like you feel like an honored guest at Disneyland. Um, every interaction you have with cast members is kind of an order of magnitude better than the experience you might have at just your regular old amusement park. So how do they do that? So we spent some time with Disney, and they talked about uh, their four keys, their operating principles. And so we came up with our own, uh, prioritized operating principles. How do you teach principles that then a cast member can apply in any situation with some autonomy, rather than having this huge policy book of, you know, what do you do in this situation? And so what we came up with was our flywheel. I, I shared that with you already. But we also came up with these operating principles, improvement, ownership, respect, and transparency. And then our, our cultural attributes. This is kind of our hiring formula. We're looking for continuous learners that are hardworking, humble, and world class. And, and that leads to this high performance culture. It's a combination of high expectations, but also high caring. When you have a com that combo, you have you know, incredible results. If you have low expectations but high caring, you have kind of a fraternity or a sorority. It's a, it's a social club. If you have high expectations and low caring, you have you know, fear-based performance. You know, people start to game the system. They start to falsify reports. When you have neither high expectations nor caring, you have an episode of The Office. You know, you have dysfunction. <laughs> And so really what we try to do is help, you know, our whole team operate in that top, top quadrant. We have a leadership model that we teach all of our new leaders at Health Catalyst. So here's the answer to that poll question. The national average of engaged team members to disengaged team members is 2 to 1. World class is considered 10 to 1. And Health Catalyst's average is 17 to 1. And so we feel like this is the secret sauce that really makes a difference. And you can see kind of some of the results. These are our scores from our customers taken by Class, another Utah company, um, that kind of does surveys and, and checks how we're doing uh, in the industry against each other. And you can see that we're significantly above the average for our segment. One practical way that we did this was with another Utah-based company. This is not a plug for Silicon Slopes. And I'm not trying to get Sweater to move to Salt Lake, but. Hey, we have some employees here. We, okay. we, we love right. Utah. Um, but uh, we use Motivosity to help reinforce the culture. So this is just a cool little pragmatic way that we implemented reinforcing our culture daily. So at the beginning of every month, every team member on, at Health Catalyst gets 10 bucks that they can only spend on other people in the company. And you can give $1, you can give $5, you can give all 10 to one person, it doesn't matter. 
But what you do is you thank them for living one of our cultural attributes or our operating principles. So if you're, you know, we're working on this project and you worked extra hard to get, you know, the job done on time, I could send you a little thank you with five Motivosity bucks. Say, Jesse, thanks for all your hard work. Thanks for staying late on Thursday to, to finish up the presentation for Friday. The presentation went well. Really appreciate your help. Thanks for, you know, demonstrating the hardworking, mm -hmm. you know, cultural attribute. So you could send that, and it's kind of this nice recognition of, hey, I did something good and I was recognized for it. That is extremely motivating. So this is just some of the stats from this last quarter. 99% of Health Catalyst pe people, team members, gave someone else a thank you. Um, 11,000 appreciations given. And this is just in the last 90 days. So you think a about that. There's a team of 1,000. So on average, um, each leader is giving 68 appreciations per quarter. So that's a constant reinforcement of the culture. And it's, it's not just something you talk about and it, on, on employee orientation day. Mm -hmm. This is something that's kind of embedded in the culture and something we found really, really useful. So pragmatic way of applying the principle. Okay, so next little segment here. I'm doing okay on time. I'm going to try to, I'm going to tip tops of the waves here. Um, there's a lot of books out there on business, you know, dozens of, of them. We kind of tried to focus in on the very best books, and these are just a few that we really thought had pragmatic ways of applying the principles. So I'm just going to cruise through these. So Disney Institute gives one about customer service, Be Our Guest. Um, they talk about putting the team member first. Um, and, and this is something that uh, our CEO, my brother Dan, has done an incredible job. Oh, by the way, Sequoia did a national search and I, for a new CEO when they invested. And at the end of it, they're like, actually, Dan's the best choice. Dan, you just be the CEO. And <laughs> um, they've got to know him. But he, he deliberately sequenced our priority. Team members first, customers second, investors third. Now, our investors didn't like that a lot. But it's the right sequence. And, and there's actually Gallup has a lot of data backing that up, that if you take good care of your team members, they'll take good care of your customers. Mm -hmm. If your customers are being successful, they'll renew, they'll expand, and they'll end up taking care of the investors. So that's the right sequence. When public companies get out of whack, they start putting the investors and the quarterly earnings first. Mm -hmm and it flips it in the reverse order and screws everything up. So that's, that's a key takeaway. Anyway, Be Our Guest talks about a lot of those principles of how do, you, how do you systematically give people a great customer experience. How Will You Measure Your Life? This is a book we give to everybody that starts uh, at the company, Clayton Christensen. It's, it helps, I think, managers realize we all are only have this little small part of an entire person. And we see their work life, but we don't see their whole life. So recognize they have an, a life outside of work mm -hmm. and treat them with respect. Treat them um, as a whole person and acknowledge that, you know, hopefully their family is the most important thing in their life and work is, you know, somewhere a third or, or fourth. Yeah. And that's okay. And you can still build a great company with being on the priority list, but not being the mm -hmm. top priority. And I love this priority because this is something that's really important to me that we're building at Sweater, too. Yep. Um, we were, I, I might need to go recount, but I think that we're 11 employees and we have 19 kids between the 11 employees. And we're very family-centric and you do have a life, right? And so I, I love this principle and I think it's so powerful when you can relay that in a very genuine way and that you live it as a company. Because it creates, I think it creates just a nice flywheel of loyalty back yeah. as well. Well, and our turnover levels are much, much lower than the, the averages for the mm -hmm. you know, tech startup space. Right. And so I think that's a real key. We, we invest in our team members. We give them a lot of flexibility. We were doing the work from home thing before COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, really flexible, flexible PTO. You know, as long as you're getting the work done, we trust you. 
And so you've got flexibility. Go to your kid's baseball game in the middle of the day. Not, no big deal. So that whole philosophy is really well articulated by Clayton Christensen in that book. Okay, this is probably one of my favorite set of books, um, Get a Grip and Traction. Same, same authors. One's more of a fable. The other one's like a practical guide. Um, but this just has a lot of things about setting goals, running meetings. Uh, I wish I'd had this like 30 years ago. My meetings would have been so, so much more efficient. But I used to have a lot of principles around kind of segmenting things into yearly buckets, 90-day buckets, seven-day buckets, and issues. And then a very pragmatic way of quickly going through and spending the bulk of meetings on solving issues rather than on rehashing politics. And uh, so, so some great principles there. Um, Good to Great has some great principles about getting the right people on the bus and then making sure they're in the right seats. Uh, getting those people in the right seats is, do they understand what the role is? Do they actually want the role? And then do they have the capacity to do the role or can we help them gain the capacity to do, do the role? And that comes to the learning flywheel, understanding for each role. What are the competencies? Assess where you're currently at. What do you need to learn? And then once you've learned it, can you demonstrate that you can apply it in real life? Another favorite book, The Invincible Company. This is, there's a whole series of these by Strategizer. And they talk about um, value proposition canvases. We, we do this a lot, mapping out how does one of our products fit with a job that the customer's trying to get done. Again, a lot of Clayton Christensen's jobs to be done theory. What are the pains they're feeling? If they use our product or services, what are the gains we anticipate they'll, they'll achieve? And so really thinking through that, um, thinking through this is probably one of the most useful tools for startups, doing um, a business, prop, uh, a business uh, canvas and understanding, is this thing desirable? Is it feasible? Is it viable? Will people pay more than it costs us to deliver? And how adaptable is it? And, and testing those questions, you'll go through this and you'll, you'll have a bunch of assumptions and then you test those assumptions. And it's really, really cool. Uh, this is something we're struggling with right now. This is something I want to get better at at Health Catalyst. There's a difference between explore and exploit. When you're in early startup phase, everything's explore. Mm -hmm. As you start to get bigger, you have to start exploiting and really systematizing, scaling the stuff that's working. But if you focus too much on that, then you don't innovate anymore. You don't do the creative stuff. And so you have to kind of, over time, as you grow, separate those and balance the two worlds. Um, the last area is Deming. So much uh, of our company is built on Deming and kind of, you know, we applied it to healthcare. It's been applied to the auto industry. But it's really about realizing there's, there's no, you know, easy button. There's no silver bullet. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of work to improve. And so you've got to... You've got to think through, this was his system. You've got to think through, what should we be doing? Can we measure how we're currently doing and predict how we're going to do in the future? And then we're probably not doing as well as we actually could. There's an opportunity, so how do we change? How do we transform? And I won't go through all the detail of that. A lot of it is improving the whole system rather than punishing outliers or punishing people. A, a process is perfectly designed to get its current results. So if you start <laughs> shaming docs, saying you're a bad doc because you got this bad outcome, well, the process produced the outcome, not the person. So what, a bit, what about the process could be improved? So we think about tightening the curve and shifting it. You know, you, this is what it looks like over time. You tighten a process, make it more consistent, and you improve it. And then everybody, every single physician in that, in that group improves, not just the ones that are on the tail. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a real key. And that doesn't apply just to healthcare. That applies to any, anything you're trying to improve. Yeah. And this, this is an area that we're looking at with Sweater in the deal-making process. Because today it could be argued that it's very kind of randomized and not very, uh, there's not a lot of tight process around it, a lot of gut feel, things like that. And so we're already talking about how we can use this process to systematize and tighten this so that we have a and more narrow range of outcomes 
that are more positive. Yeah. This is about change. It's, uh, you know, how do you convince the right people to change? It's the early adopters that influence everybody else. And so if you can get enough early adopters to adopt, you know, it's the, it's the people that wait in line to buy the new iPhone and then all their friends ask them, hey, is that worth getting? <laughs> That's the early adopter. And so you figure out who those people are in any group. You convince them and they convince everybody else. This is the last slide I'll share and then we'll, we'll open it up to some questions. But this is the process we take everything through. Do we understand that this is the, our seven question framework? It's Deming. Do we understand the problem? Do we know where we want to be? What's our goal? What's our aim? Do we know the root cause of the problems? Do we know what we want to change? When we make the change, um, can we measure that change? And then was the change actually an improvement? A lot of times we change things and it actually stays the same or get, gets worse. And then can we, if it is a good change, can we sustain that change over time? So we can apply those seven questions to anything we're trying to improve. That includes all, our, all of our internal processes. It includes things we work on with our clients. So here are the results. We took a lot of you know, these great principles, kind of timeless principles from the best books. In priority order, we think it's helped us achieve you know, 50 best place to work awards with our customers saving thousands of lives and literally hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and then with our investors, it's been a good ride for them. Their, their uh, value as, as shareholders has increased over time. But I'm most proud, I'll share this as the last story. When we went public, this is in 2019, before the dark times, before COVID, where no one wore a mask. Um, we broke a record at NASDAQ. Anybody guess what, the, what record we broke? We had the most team members. We were five people over the fire limit in there. <laughs> uh, don't tell anybody. But um, we had the most at the, they have this opening trades kind of ceremony. Mm -hmm. And this is a beautiful, nice buffet lunch. And we had the most team members that they've ever had attend one of those, which we're really proud of because it really was a, a massive group effort of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people. And, uh, and we, we rented out a bunch of buses, and there, there we all are in, in front of the World Trade Center. Um, it, was a, it was a really fun time. Yeah, that's awesome. And it was cool voluntary, experience. right? I mean, it's not like you said, let's break the record, and you paid for everybody to no. go there. This was people, no, we, like, team members volunteering to go, right? We, we, we uh, paid the way of the first 100 team members and then invited anybody else who, who wants to come, you're welcome to join us. And so a lot of these team members were paying their own way to be there. And right. joined us, and it was a it was a spectacular event. That's awesome. So, all right, let's. Well, yeah, thank you. Let's let's give Tom a round. Applause here. Thank you. All right. So we do have some some questions that have come in. Uh, first of all, for those that are on YouTube, um, they're having a hard time seeing the slides. Yeah, we'll send out the slides. Okay, we'll we'll make sure we ship out the slides. This is the first time we've been in this venue with this particular format. Usually, we're doing a Zoom where it's a lot easier to share the screen. So. We'll send out the slides to everybody that's, that's virtual. And of course, all of you that are here as well, uh, make sure you get a copy. So a specific question. Uh, over the past several years, Health Catalyst has acquired six organizations. What have you learned from these experiences? Yeah, so um, acquiring an, uh, an organization, um, and we've actually had more than that because we've also created a, what, what we call our smart sourcing business where we take over an entire analytics department of a hospital system. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, it's, it's very challenging because you've got, you know, 50 or 100 people that instantly become Catalyst team members, mm -hmm. whether from a, a company we've acquired or from an analytics department or a, a, a chart abstraction department we've taken over, and now they're part of Catalyst. They're Catalyst team members. We take a lot of time helping integrate them into the culture, Help, helping them feel welcome, helping them feel a part of our, our culture. We've tried, and, and in almost every case, we've been able to uh, make sure we keep everybody, bring them straight across. Um, we have some people that opt to, to leave when they, you know, they're like, now I joined a health system. I, didn't, I don't want to be 
part of a software company or, or they'll, they'll go. But I would say 85 to 90% of the people stay at Health Catalyst. And then our, our people ops team, our, our team really tries to um, engage them in the culture, engage them in the mission of the company um, and adopt that as their mission and give them that opportunity to adopt it and, and become part of the mission. And we've been pretty successful at doing that. I think in almost every case, our engagement scores have gone up as those team members have kind of experienced the catalyst way and in our culture, and they say, yeah, this is, this is a great culture, and they contribute at a great level. Um, and we are, we've been very grateful. Some of our very best people have come from those acquisitions. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things we recognize, you know, we're good at some things. There are other things we're not good at. And rather than take all that time to develop that, if someone's already got it figured out, let's learn from them. Let's, let's have them join us. And uh, with our capital and their great ideas, uh, it's a very synergistic type of thing. Yeah. Um, great question. So next question here. Um, let's see where to go. Do you anticipate collaboration with other existing data and CRM aggregators like Epic Systems as you as you scale, or do you view yourselves as completely independent kind of a solution? I think we'll continue to collaborate with others. I think we want to stay an independent company. Um, we have no plans of being acquired or merging in with anybody mm -hmm. bigger than us. Our, our purpose would be to stay Health Catalyst and just continue to grow. But I think we will collaborate with partners with others that have um, like-minded missions that are trying to achieve similar things. We we think there's enough problems to solve in healthcare that you know mm -hmm. there's there's room for plenty of players, and, and we have some great partnerships. Um, we have a great partnership with Amplifier, who does all of our learning platform. We build a lot of the content, but we're leveraging their platform. We have a deep relationship with Microsoft, um, with Azure. Um, so, so there are, I think, you know, this is a big enough industry and a big enough set of problems that there's room for a lot of players and a lot of collaboration. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so here's one, I think it's probably out of the UK. Um, it says NHS in the UK struggles the most with a lot of red tape. So do you feel like privatization or commercialization at IHC is what helped I don't know, I guess create this agile kind of framework that you're able to operate within. Yeah, so so we just <coughs> excuse me, we just signed our, our first deal in the UK with guys in St. Thomas in London. And there is uh, a little bit more red tape in the UK. I will I will uh, confirm that. Um, there's a lot of red tape in in the US mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating to me. Um, as, as we deal with red tape and kind of getting people access to data, I like to remind people. So we have a, a, an app around sepsis. Sepsis is a really severe infection. And our software helps point out where the problems in the process are mm -hmm. and then fix those problems. So, for example, on average in the United States, if someone gets sepsis, um, there's a 25% chance you're going to die. Now, if you can implement the best practice, if you can do what we know works, and, and you have to do it within the first three hours, you can reduce that from a 25% chance of dying down to less than 10%. And so when I'm getting pushback from a chief you know, security officer on granting access to clinicians, I kind of remind them. So every month that we don't get this access to these clinicians, 12 people die. Because your average right now is 25% on sepsis. And those that implement our software is less than 10%. So I just want you to know that your delays are they're not just killing us, you know, metaphorically. They're actually killing people when they delay. And that usually unjams the logs. And and we get some we get some and I, you know, my brother Dan doesn't like it when I do that, but because it's not that politically correct to, you know. Be that direct, <laughs> but with. it's still true. But it's true, and so try to t trying to tie it back to why we're doing this, and get get someone who at first is a blocker to realize well, we're not doing this because we you know want to get our check sooner. 
You know, we don't get paid that way. We get paid on a subscription. So you pay us whether you're using it or not. We really want you to get this so you improve care for your patients. Mm -hmm. So whenever you can connect it back for the reason, the purpose, the mission, I think that's what helps you cut through a lot of red tape. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I got one more question from the audience and then one question I'm going to ask you. Okay. So this, this one's a good one. So you mentioned you left Checker Auto Parts when they went public. Yes. So for Health Catalyst, outside of achieving a VC exit, why take Health Catalyst public? It's a great question. So when you pick up the accepting um, you know, outside money from Sequoia or whoever, you pick up the other end of that stick, which is some sort of an exit strategy so they can get a return on their investment. Um, we felt that going public was the better of the two choices. So you can either go public or you can be acquired mm-hmm. by a strategic. And we felt that our best chance of maintaining the mission was to go public. Now, we have to work harder as a public company than we did as a private hum- company to maintain the mission. But we feel like that's doable, whereas if you get absorbed into a GE Healthcare mm-hmm. or a you know, a large, <laughs> you know, United Healthcare insurance company or something like that. I mean, there were probably seven or eight times we were, people tried to acquire us and we said no, because we knew that would destroy the culture. It would be mm-hmm. gone and it would get absorbed into the mother, the mothership. Yeah. So that's, now it's harder. I, I, I will admit it's harder. There's, there's pressure from Wall Street to hit your quarterly numbers, but we always try to keep that sequence in mind. Take care of our team members first. They'll take care of our customers. And the customers will renew and expand. And that will keep the investors happy. Mm-hmm. And we try to always keep it in that order. We truly believe that that's how we'll stay successful. If we ever flip those, that's when we start making right. decisions that aren't good for our team members. And then they disengage. Mm-hmm. And we start dr- drifting towards that two-to-one versus 17-to-one engagement. What's interesting, an engaged team member doesn't just produce 5% more. It's 500% more. Wow. So it's compared to a disengaged mm-hmm. person that's just like surfing the web every day and looking for a new job on LinkedIn. So there's a huge difference between what an engaged team member produces versus a disengaged team member. So we, again, that's why you want to keep that engagement high mm-hmm. and take care of your team first. Awesome. Great question. Okay, so last question. All right. It's a selfish one. All right, so, Tom, you're an investor in Sweater. Yes, I am a proud investor in Sweater. <laughs> yes, and you, you're supporting our mission and continue to support us. So what is it for you that it excites you about what Sweater is doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Jesse. I think I'm most excited about um, letting more people participate in the American dream. Um, there's kind of this exclusive club that I don't think should be exclusive, and that's being able to invest in innovative startups early when they're, when they're just learning and growing and figuring things out. Now, there's more risk involved in that, in that but um, I, think, I think everyone should have that opportunity. And to be part of that, which is, I think, core to, to Sweater's mission is opening that up to lots of people that believe in the American dream, that it's possible for anybody to, to have a great idea, build a company, and provide you know, great products and services uh, to, you know, to their customers and to the world. And to be a part of that on the investment side I think should be available to a lot more people. So that's why I'm excited. Awesome. Well, we love having you. Thank you so much, Justin. Right. Thanks for, yeah, thanks thank for you. having me. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. All right. I don't know how we killed the live feed, but.